When I, when I finished reading today's story about Nicodemus, I wondered, you know, how many of us these days are kind of like him, walking through the darkness of our lives to find reassurance in this life. In this second Sunday of Lent, Nicodemus is the next character we pick up for the journey, the journey as we walk to Jesus toward Calvary, and ultimately, Easter morning. Each week, we'll see that another character joins us in the walk. Now, you might wonder how, how in the world could this 2,000-year-old big shot, uh, the ultra-high priest of Judaism, could possibly have anything to do with us sitting here in Danbury this windy morning. But you see, he is a lot like us. He feels the wind and the uncertainty. He's every man and every woman. And what he's feeling touches everyone just like the wind. He has a lot of questions, and we do too. He's insecure enough that he won't let any of his colleagues know that he's seeking Jesus, that he wants to believe, but he can't. Not quite. So he seeks him out in the cover of darkness so nobody knows. Nicodemus is such a hard-headed, just-the-facts, ma'am, kind of realist that what Jesus has been talking about seems impossible for an old man. He's confused, and he and Jesus both know it. Nicodemus has heard Jesus talk about being born again. It puzzled him as much as perhaps it puzzles some of us today. I know for many of us mainline Protestants, we're not sure what it means. Yeah, other than the fact that our evangelical brethren say it and they wear it like a ticket to heaven whenever we talk to them. But ever the literalist, Nicodemus has said to Jesus, how can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? He was that hung up on that. One thing we should notice about this gospel scene, Nicodemus comes in the darkness to seek the light. And think about it. Think about it. Isn't this the way each one of us enters the world? From a place of darkness, we are thrust into the light and the cold rush of wind as we are swept up into somebody's arms. And this is what Jesus tries to explain to Nicodemus. Being born from above is not like our first birth, but our second. It is to be embraced by the wind and the spirit as light floods our souls. Jesus says the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit. Someone that we don't talk about a lot here, but we know is here. The Spirit. We meet, we meet the Spirit in action in the very first chapter of Genesis, if you read that book. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss. And a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The mighty wind makes way for the light. That wind, that breath of God, it was known by the ancient Hebrews and would have been known by Nicodemus as the Shekinah, the divine feminine, that while they knew Father Creator it, with force and anger and judgment, the Shekinah was the Spirit of God that accompanied Moses and his band of, across the wilderness in the dark to the Promised Land. The Spirit of God 
has attributes of love, compassion, justice, and healing. Spirit, she, she suddenly arrives to lead us out of the dark. I know I, I was raised in an era when God was always a he. But as I grew up, I realized I was putting limits on God with gender. In our Christian thought, the concept of the Shekinah from the old way is contained in our, in our understanding of the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity. I know for some of us, we struggle with recognizing what, when it is that the Spirit drops down on us. You probably spend most of your time just praying to God and not thinking a lot about the Spirit. Actually, I think you know the Spirit pretty well here, especially what I saw this morning before I came in with the choir. You know, I can tell you, whenever your heart is stirred by a piece of music, whenever the choir transports you out of the grayness of your mood, whenever you are surprised by a sunset over Candlewood or at the top of Worcester Heights, as I do when I go home, and its colors penetrate your soul. Whenever your ears get as a giggle from your grandchild, and it sounds exactly like your dad when he was alive, that's the spirit leading you out of the darkness into the light, the truth. How fitting is it that when Nicodemus comes looking for the way he can be born again. That Jesus explains that water and the spirit is what need, needs to be taken. The divine feminine is, the, is what the high priest would have understood and what compromises the experience of being born from above. Still, the good rabbi, like Nicodemus is, he questions Jesus. Frederick Buechner, who's one of the gifted writers and theologians who just passed this last fall, imagine this middle of the night scene between Jesus and Nicodemus, the two of them perhaps over cups of tea in the kitchen near a dying fire. And this is what Buechner imagined. A gust of wind happened to whistle down the chimney and at that point made the dying embers burst into flame. And Jesus said being born again was like that. It wasn't something you did. The wind did it. The spirit did it. It was something that happened for God's sake. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. That's when Jesus really got going. Jesus said, I'm telling you, God's so in love with the world that he sent me, sent me down so that you don't have to believe with your own eyes, then maybe you'll believe with mine. Maybe you believe me. Maybe you won't come sneaking around half scared to death in the dark anymore but will come to, come clean, come to life. What impressed Nicodemus even more than that speech was the quickening of his own breathing and the pounding of his heart. He felt he hadn't felt like this since his first kiss or since the time his first child was born. Later on, it was Nicodemus who was again with Jesus when Jesus was dead. Nicodemus went along with Joseph of Arimathea to pay his last respects at the tomb in broad daylight. It was a crazy thing to do, what with the witch hunt that was going on, but he decided it was more than worth it. When he heard the next day that some of the disciples had seen Jesus alive again. He wept like a newborn child. He wept like a newborn child. 
Nicodemus, you see, had been born again and swaddled in the spirit. Amen. One of the places that I've most often felt the spirit arrive and fill the room is when I've been in the presence of someone who's dying. I remember being in with a man who was dying at the hospital. And I was an intern at that time in chaplaincy. I walked in, there were 25 people in the room waiting for me to pray. And it was a shock. And then I said, just take me and let me do what, what you want me to do. And so as I prayed over him, and he at this point was comatose. I'd seen him earlier when he wasn't. But he was comatose, and as I prayed him over, as I said, the room filled, filled with the spirit. I can't explain it to you if you've been in this situation with people who are transitioning into the next existence, you know what I'm talking about. But as I prayed over him, all of a sudden he opened his eyes and looked at me and he said, thank you. And that was it. The spirit had him and took him to where he belonged. Look for the Holy Spirit in your life this week. For the joys and also for the tragedies as we learned about the tragedy this morning. You can be the instrument of peace and healing for someone. Just ask the Spirit to use you. May God bless you and keep you all this week. May God, may God's face to shine upon you and the Spirit to move through you. Now and evermore, amen. Thank you.